Nice, nice. All right, let's get underway, everybody. I'll fade out my inspirational music for now. Oh, that went smoothly. I have to, I'm getting, I'm getting the hang of this. All right, everybody, welcome to Logic Live. My name's Andy. Today we have yet another Andy joining us. We have Andy Davis. But before we begin, Logic Live is brought to you by AJA. And we are very happy to have their support. AJA develops an extensive range of solutions for the professional video and audio market. From conversion devices to IO solutions, digital recorders, cameras, and more. If there's anything you need in the world of IO, you definitely need to get it from our friends at AJA. And as they like to say, AJA, we can't fix the text module, but if you need video IO, we've got you covered. You can see what they have to offer at AJA.com. And Logic Live is also sponsored by Cinesis Oceana. These guys are my, excuse me, my personal reseller. I've been working with them for 15 years, could not do what I do without them. And they've always supported the Flame community, sponsoring user groups all over North America. And um, we thank them very much for their continued support. If there's anything you need, uh, definitely reach out to Synesis at Synesis.io. Synesis Oceana, solutions, integration, and support for digital content creators supporting Flame artists since 1997. All right, I'm going to stop the share here. And we're going to welcome to Logic Live, Andy Davis. Hey. Howdy. How's it going, Good man? Good to see y'all. It goes well. It goes well. It's not quite so hot here in Los Angeles. Well, right now. Enjoy it while it lasts. Got to enjoy everything while it lasts. <laughs> Amen, brother. If that, isn't, if that isn't like maybe, you know, the banner for 2020, right? Let's enjoy it while it lasts. Um, I, uh, I want to say, if, if, for those of you who, uh, who, who don't know Andy, he's, uh, and, and this, this entire conversation is going to be like an Andy fest. So um, I swear I'm not talking about myself in the third person just yet. That, that starts um, week 20 of the pandemic. So but here in, we're safely ensconced in week 18. And so, you know, I'm still able to tell myself from, from Andy Davis. But um, Andy is a, a flame artist and, <laughs> sorry, it's, it, it's gonna be a thing, especially for my family that's sitting on the other side of this wall, who's gonna hear me talking about myself in the third person. Um, Andy is a flame artist and a supervisor uh, based out in LA. And uh, I'm sure you've seen his posts on Logic about things like getting motion capture data into flame and recreating accurate depth of field. Uh, Andy is a fascinating and brilliant guy with a real eye for where the industry is going. So I wanna welcome him again to Logic Live. And uh, Andy pre-recorded some videos for us to watch because uh, I, I know you, you bounce around a lot between different apps and that's kind of the theme for today's presentation. Um, but uh, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. Yeah, so I, I felt the need to pre-record uh, this stuff because I'm, I'm on multiple machines, multiple S's, and just to make it a bit clearer and not waste anybody's time, uh, just to try to get the idea of the gist of how games tech and VFX tech is overlapping these days. And there's some real exciting possibilities for, for creativity. Well, without any further ado, I'm going to uh, screen share here and we'll play your first video, this introduction, and we'll go from there. So I pre-recorded a bunch of this because I'm bouncing between multiple apps and OSs for this workflow. Um, Game Tech has become an exciting resource for VFX in the last few years. There's a lot of stuff out there. The haystack is huge. But if you have interest, get in and start playing with the tools. It's perfect for those years when you can't go outside. Uh, when starting for the purposes of understanding workflow, I suggest that you spoke, focus on specific tasks to avoid being overwhelmed. There are huge amounts of free tutorial resources out there. The area is evolving so quickly that it's honestly hard to keep up. There are lots of interesting developments, including video walls from The Mandalorian, etc. Uh, they're all worth checking out. Specifically, I would say to check out Matt Workman's YouTube channel. He's a cinematographer but that has been on the forefront of virtual production. Uh, personally, I've been focusing on R&D that I can do without incurring huge costs in the given current environment. So first off, no one app or OS can do everything. Uh, Flame is my creative tool of choice. Its high quality and interactivity for final imagery is unrivaled in my opinion, uh, especially for real-time creative discussions with clients. There are lots of helpful 3D tools within Flame, but true CG tests are honestly better done with CG-centric tools. 
The trick is passing data accurately between the apps, which allows a whole bunch of flexibility and allows you to use each app for what it's good for. Uh, CG apps are to taste. Uh, Houdini is my preference. Uh, Blender is a great tool as well. I urge you to use whatever gets you assets to play with quickly and consistently. Game engines. So I picked Unreal as it was the most accessible. It also, Quixel Mega Scans is free for Unreal, which is an amazing library of game ready assets. As long as you render through the game engine, apparently the whole library is completely free. Though you can use the FBX and other apps. If you wanted to do your final render in an other app, that might be a different case than with the free. I honestly don't know. The streamlining of CG rendering on game engine is huge. Even if it's not real time, it's crazy fast and the quality is stunning. Now, a true CG app will likely give you better render quality, but within the game engine, you have a render in minutes. Um, I did a test render of a Quixel project in Unreal, which I posted. 1,300 full CG 4K EXR frames in 10 minutes on old hardware. It was a Z620, 64 gigs of RAM, and a GTX 1080 Ti. My, uh, my settings need improvement, uh, but still, it's crazy impressive. Uh, project tracking apps. These workflows can quickly grow complex. Shotgun using Python can track and even create assets. Artists automatically load and publish to their correct directories, which allows them to, con to concentrate on making great imagery. Confusion is the enemy of VFX. This topic is a huge haystack on its own, so I won't go into this today. Uh, but it's certainly worth looking into, even as a small studio. Uh, besides Shotgun's documentation, Alan Letary and Jesse Morrow did a few videos about their Shotgun integration that I found extremely helpful. On the OS front, although I prefer Mac and Linux, honestly, you need to run a Windows box for some tools. It's unavoidable at this point. Uh, Houdini at Digital Assets. So HDAs are similar in concept to a new gizmo. They can make tools that work from within Houdini, but they also can work from within other apps, uh, Unreal, Unity, Maya, etc. Uh, one of the benefits is that it automatically handles world scale and rotation differences without user input, which is really helpful because each app has its own uh, predefined scale and some, in some cases in the game engine, rotation is different than we're used to in VFX. So why is this complexity worth the hassle? Setting this up correctly enables incredible creativity and flexibility. I hope you find some of the following info helpful. Yeah, I Andy, I, you know, kind of yeah, I, dude, you know, when we, when we did our, our run through the other day, uh, I was really, you know, it, I kind of, I had this like epiphany moment, you know, as, as you were explaining to me the, uh, your philosophy of getting things back and forth in between, uh, between apps. And it's really, it's really true. You know, when, when, um, uh, flame used to be an island, or at least you know maybe that's how many of a, a, us flame artists used to you know it, it work with flame. But uh, now that more and more it's it's uh, part of a pipeline, and and as artists we're kind of going back and forth uh, from app to app based on needs and things. Um, being aware of uh, of how different apps deal with data, how it how they deal with scale, orientation, and things like that is just as important as how. Um, uh, color ma as as uh, being aware of color management when you pass images back and forth between apps. So I, I think this stuff is 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 more relevant than ever, especially with like you said, all the game engine assets available to us. Well, I think part of the thing is this: is that all the all our tools are good at different things. Okay, for interactivity and dealing with clients, Flame is the place. Okay, like I that's my tool. Uh, I'm most fluent in it. I don't think about the interface. It's just my tool of choice. Um, now, when you want to get something that's hero CG looking, a CG app is where you want to be. It's got ray tracing, different kinds of uh, ways of addressing high quality CG imagery. But games kind of goes back towards the interactivity side. Now, its quality isn't quite as good as a CG app for if you're going to compare them next to each other, although that's getting closer. Um, but then again, you can get decisions made quickly. You can have, you know, you can have a world. We could have a world where we see our location. In some ways, the game is kind of like filming is a game. Um, the whole project is a game. So how, mm -hmm. you, when you bring it into it, you're using each tool that it's good for. Okay, so like for instance, if I want to get real-time focus pulls, I can do that in the game engine and bring that back into the, either CG or into Flame or camera movement. Um, those things can be captured in real time from the game engine and then brought back 
to the tool that we prefer to use it in. Whereas if we tried to get it all working from all sides, then we're not going to, um, you're always going to end up being a jack of all trades in a, in the, you know, here in a master of none. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that uh, the, the other thing is that the game engine stuff is so fast that it's actually a lot of fun. That's why I use the Spielberg picture is that I want, you know, I feel like we need to get, have fun, get our clients to have fun making this stuff. The CG ship is a very big, cumbersome thing. Um, and it's sometimes our jobs to shield them so we can get our creative decisions made. Um, but we need uh, tools that allow us to be able to have these conversations in real time. And these are, this is one of those tools. Mm -hmm. Do you want to uh, uh, dive into the second video? Yeah, let's do that because I, I, the first, the second video is basically uh, uh, more flame centric, and the third video is more of some of the stuff that I was playing between Unreal and Houdini. Uh, so let's let's do some of the flame centric tools next. Uh, when bouncing between different apps, it's critically important to understand scale. Apps treat this differently. Flame works in millimeters, Houdini works in meters, Unreal works in centimeters, and not only that, the z-axis is up instead of the y-axis, which is what we're used to in visual effects. I used to import an FBX into Flame, viewed it through the camera from the same FBX, everything looked okay, and I moved on. But that might look right, but this is wrong. The reason it's wrong, the world scale is critically important, when, especially when you're bouncing between apps. As an example, I've got here an uh, FBX that's one meter square that I brought into Flame from Houdini. If everything's correct, Z should be offset by a thousand. This should do exactly this. It exactly lines up. So a thousand units, which is millimeters in Flame, is correct for the one meter square object from Houdini. If you have trouble with this, I've noticed in the past that this ruler here, enable it, it defined. This defaults to 400. Change it to a thousand took define off, re-imported my model, and that seemed to fix this. And why is it wrong? And what's the impact of it? Why is this important? What I have here is I have a the same FBX brought into two different scenes, one where the scale was at 10%, the other where the scale is at 1,000, which is correct. And you can see even detail in the model, the way that the IO is calculated, is completely wrong here compared to what's going on here where it's correct. The numbers that we use in Flame, where when I scale this back, you can see the scale of what these units mean is wrong, whereas here it's correct. I mean, everything can get very touchy if your scale is off. Your controls may not act as you would expect. So Mixamo is an app that Adobe has that has characters and animations that are downloadable uh, that you can then bring into your game or CG app. It's, it's a huge library. It's a lot of fun. And so I wanted to bring it into Flame. Now, sometimes when you bring in an FBX for Flame, if I were to bring this in with all these defaults on, and, and nothing happens. What's interesting, though, is that if you were to take that and turn all these off, including the geo, then what you get is something that says that we want to align the animation at frame one. And you get this, these locators, and you can connect to the different parts. There's a lot of information that we could attach different things for yeah, after the CG render. I even went as far when I was doing one frame of white to create a, a character based off simple geometry. So here's a quick example of me swapping out an animation with another animation from Mixamo. You know, it's a little tedious, and I'm sure there's a way of Python scripting this that would make it much more automated, but it's um, it actually works pretty well. So basically, here is just a character that's using the Mixamo data. Other CG apps that will be doing this better, okay, and you still want to use CG apps for a lot of things, but this is just a real nice quick way of getting human-sized things and animations into your scene quickly.
So here's a sped up uh, walkthrough through the vast library of quicks. There's so many answers to take a look at. It's really worth taking your time to pick through. You'll spend many days looking through. Many of these assets are available to import into Flink. It's worth checking out. Uh, so you can have 3D previews of what it is. There's surfaces, there's uh, decals, there's all sorts of stuff. can bring these Quixel assets into our flame and these are wireframes so you can see what these level of details. Level of detail is a way for uh, games and CG apps to basically lighten up the, the load so that for background objects uh, they, they automatically become less detailed. So you can see the amount of geometry between a higher level of detail for the same asset and a lower level of detail. Now, should we then turn on the make these solid, we can see what these assets would look like in renderable form. So another thing that we could do is games and uh, CG apps can use instancing to also lighten the load. And we don't have instancing exactly in Flame, but our antiquated particle system can generate instances of the same object. So in this case, I have this, this Quixel asset that's just a rock in there, and this terrain, and I have these coconuts that are basically being generated by the particles in random orientations on the terrain that's supplied. So it's kind of a fun hack. It's an insanely fun hack. Yeah, and you can end up layering that stuff. I've had some luck doing that. Um, you know, this is kind of pushing things to a degree that, you know, especially on my old trash can Mac, it, you know, you're gonna you're gonna break them here and there. But it because you're all referencing the same object, it still stays reasonably light. It can take a minute to to load up, but once you're actually working, it actually seems like it, it's very interactive. Yeah. Well, let's break down some of the things that were in that video. Um, you know, it, it's. All the time, uh, as flame artists, we're asked to, you know, look to do look dev, to kind of figure out what's this going to look like, how 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 could the shot, uh, or what's this going to look like, and you know, there are so many times where the the thing that we create uh, then has to be passed on to someone else, and you know, like I, we have a CG department at at, uh, at Lively where we work, and uh, the ability for me, if I if I was going to sit in session with a client and kind of mock up a scene for them. Um, the only way that that really benefits us as a company is if I've built that to scale. You know, I didn't just fake it. I didn't just throw a model of something over on the right-hand side there and scaled it up and down so it looked right. If I build my world to, to, to scale, when it gets passed off to CG, who always builds things to scale, then it's going to be relevant information. I think that's what you were illustrating in the, uh, in the first part of the, the video there. Yeah, I think like scale, when you get into dealing with scale, um, when you get your scale nailed down correctly, suddenly things such as depth of field calculations and all those things just come along for the ride, okay? And you mm -hmm. can check these things. And so, um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're getting a track back, you don't realize that it is out of scale. You know, it's good, it's good to check these things. But if, if you're making sure to keep, keep, you're making sure that your information is clean and accurate, then when your FBX goes out to the other guys, then they, can just start running. Okay, there's no troubleshooting there. It should be able to just work as is. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when you posted the uh, the motion capture little test there um, on Logic, and that's just wild. I, it's something. I mean, I, I never thought about um, importing an FBX with basically everything turned off just for the purpose of getting the locators in. I didn't know it would work that way until I did it, um, but it's actually quite it's handy. Undocumented I mean, like, feature is what we call it. I suppose so. I mean, it's you're just turning off the geometry, but I guess what's interesting is that the FBX seems to, like at some points it just sort of shrugs and like it doesn't know what to do, so it gives you nothing. But then when you start turning off certain things, you realize that, oh, okay, there's, there is information here that's helpful. So, you know, if you wanted to attach something to a CG or an, around an area of a CG character, that locator is very helpful, right? Even on top of the render. 
you know, especially if you've got a camera and then you've got a locator, you can create an element that just sits in the scene at the same place as that, even though you, without having to go back to see you. Mm -hmm. Totally. And the, uh, talk to me a little bit about the, the Quixel bridge. I thought that that was, uh, again, like an example of a great resource that's out there. Okay. So what Quixel bridge is, is with, it comes with, it was acquired by Unreal, it's a subscription type of product before. And apparently the way it works with Unreal is that if you use it within Unreal, you get access to the whole library. And you can, when you go through that, you sign up through Unreal and then you download the, uh, the asset that you'd like. You put them in your shopping cart and they all download. And then you export it to whatever you're using it in, whether it be Unreal or Unity or you know, no plane at this point. But you know, other you know, Maya's in there. Mm -hmm. um, so what, whichever you were to choose, it exports and then it shows up in there. Now, because it's FBX, FBX is a great all around uh, bridge for all, all of our tools because it works between all of them. So uh, Alembic does too, but uh, I think as an overall, the, the one that has the broadest uh, acceptance for everything, it would be FBX. So that's why, you know, it's just interesting to be able to start playing with those things and understanding how the normal maps and the roughness and all that stuff can be used in Flame. You might not be ray tracing inside of Flame, but that doesn't mean that your stuff can't still look really nice comparatively speaking. And those assets, there's, you know, you can layer them. They have a separate app called Mixer that allows you to layer these on top of each other to create grunge and all sorts of stuff. So um, tiling doesn't become apparent. Um, and I'm only really just scratching the surface of what this stuff is possible for. Um, but the, the fact is that because the way FBX works, you can get the stuff in and out to any of these apps. And that's helpful mm -hmm. to, to go back and forth. Uh, even if your final render is in, maybe my final render is in Unreal, but maybe I want to do my focus pull in Flame where I can add the lens distortion and the glares and et cetera that I prefer. Um, so I could bring the data back into Flame for my focus pulls, uh, de defocus, et cetera. Uh, so again, you're just choosing to use which app for which thing. And if you can make it so that they all sort of talk, if you understand the workflow enough that you can get them to talk to each other enough or understand what the idiosyncrasies are between them, then when you bring bounce back into uh, whichever app, you're just, you're just working, you're just continuing to work. Now, if you were to use Shotgun, you can actually have it so that it automatically loads apps and, or loads assets and stuff, which could also be helpful. But I think you might need to get a little bit Python uh, heavy to get that working correctly. But the idea is uh, that, you know, once you have it in, you know, the, just get the artist working and then suddenly this mm -hmm. thing's there. They don't have to worry about it, you know, and that's, that's what I'd like. I like to keep artists making pictures, not artists trying to figure out where the hell something is on disk. Right. Where the hell something is on disk and, you know, is this the right level of, is this the right depth of field? Is this the right color space? Is this the right anything? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that like as you understand how the color space works or how the uh, where the scale is, and there there are there is answers to these questions. That is the truth. That is the fact. You can choose to be creatively different, but this gets you in the ballpark real fast. So the fact is, even though not all lenses are going to be fifty millimeter, is going to be exactly fifty millimeter. It's going to get you really close if you have the correct sensor that you're putting that that lens info into in the f-stop. So you, the, basically you use sensor, f-stop, and focal length, and basically the rest of it, and your focus distance. The rest of it's all calculated automatically. Um, the one thing I didn't have a chance to get to for today was in a, a more in-depth explanation of my depth of field tool, which uh, maybe I'll do it at a later date. Sounds good. Yeah, I've always wanted to say at the end of one of these things, oh, it was great having you, and uh, the next time you're back in town, please stop by, you know? So thank you. You've, you've made my um, amateur broadcaster dreams, you know, another, another one of them come true. Um, I hope to be able to stop by sometime. Well, there's right that now, too. It seems, right? it seems a bit far <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, yeah, yeah. When we did the run through, you were talking about um, data and, uh, and, and, and maybe one of the wild things about all the, the game engine technology uh, is that it kind of opens the mind up to seeing um, 
other possibilities, right? You you were telling me that you um, you had rigged up a, a tangent panel to uh, to to control the camera, right? Yeah, so that's something I posted on Logic a while back, um, and so you know everything can be a game controller. Okay, so in my case, I would use I I, I would use game uh, I would use my tangent panels using expressions to drive my camera can drive its position, can drive its focus, all those things. Now, what's tricky about that is the tangent panels are based on color, and especially the big wheels on a, on a Pullman panel, each has a different thing that it's referencing, offset, gamma, and gain. So the math is actually, for the expressions, is different for each one, which is a little bit annoying. Um, mm -hmm. but, so, but, the, but the nice thing about a, a, a color panel is that it's designed to have multiple inputs in real time. So I could be using all the wheels and it should still be capturing in real time. That's why it works so great in color. So to be able to use that kind of technology in Flame was really helpful. The one thing we can't do is we can't, I can't capture runtime with the panels in Flame. And the game engines at this point don't support color panels because color panels are exotic for what they're doing. But you know, you can use other kinds of game controls. You can use Vibes, you can use your iPad. You can capture your camera uh, using an iPad. There's lots of great demos on the Unreal site. Um, I look for things on virtual production uh, and look for things on Sequencer. Sequencer is basically the game engine's timeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the next set of videos, we'll show a little bit of like, that's where you get your X FBXs out. So basically inside the game engine, you have this big haystack of assets and then you have levels where these assets are populated and do things and those levels go into sequencer and then you can take takes of these things um, whether and it can capture the images you can capture the uh the data from those things and then you can back export that back out either as images or, or fbx data and then bring it back into another program gotcha um does anybody have any questions for andy before we move on to the next uh, next topic So far, so good. This is great, man. Um, I don't know. Maybe nobody. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, there is one. Hold on. Here you go. Oh, there's two. The first one. How much does Unreal Engine cost to use? Free. Free. Oh, it's the free. best kind of answer. No, I think the thing is, is that if you I, if you make over a game that makes over I don't know a million dollars, it's it then you have to pay for it at that point. But for the for all intents and purposes intense person yeah for all intents and purposes um it's free and then quicks mm -hmm. is free too so just install it it's on all os's that's excellent what about um what's the best way to get started with unreal just start playing with it um there's a lot of uh the the once you load unreal there's tutorials within the app then there's also the uh, the, uh, the epic marketplace which has unbelievable amounts of resource so you you they have stuff for architectural visualization they have stuff for creating different kinds of games okay um there's there if you were working with cad assets you have different means than if you were working with making a, a 2d shooter game or something mm -hmm. like that so you start figuring out what these things are but i'd say that the biggest thing is it's a little overwhelming but just jump in and try it okay and there's a lot to it uh it's really not that hard um for some of the stuff, again, a PC is going to be necessary. So if you wanted to use uh, you know, VR, PC is necessary. You can't run Steam uh, on, on a Mac. Uh, you might be able to do it on Linux. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, MIDI, uh, I see Ivo was talking about MIDI. Yes, you can use MIDI controllers in it. They, uh, they, you can do pretty much, even, even you, if you wanted to use your PlayStation controller or your Xbox controller, those can be mapped into there. Um, so there's a, there's a real wealth of opportunity out there. Uh, pretty much, you know, it's just figuring out where it is in the haystack. So that's the tricky part is, um, you know, <laughs> luckily we're all in lockdown. So we have time <laughs> to look into things like this. But I, but I think that the reality is, is that there's really a lot of exciting stuff going on and the, the possibilities are really quite broad. Um, from Brandon here, question, would you recommend learning how to first build environments in Unreal or learn how to get data out with existing scenes? 
Uh, I mean, it's to taste. I think the fact is that creating environments in Unreal is quite straightforward. I mean, with if you use the Quixel Megascans assets, you literally just drop them into your scene and start moving them around. Um, it's yeah. amazing. So, but then the question is that if you, if you were looking to try to get the data out, that's when, or when you're trying to create stuff in takes, okay, that's where the sequencer, the take sequencer comes into, into play. So that's, uh, out of the many menus, that's the one that's gonna be the one that's probably a VFX hub would be bringing this data in and out, or especially bringing the data in and out. I think cameras can only come in through the sequencer um, instead of the asset browser. Um, cameras and uh, geo can go out through the sequencer. You know what we should do? Let me show, um, in case anybody hasn't seen it, show the, uh, the Unreal test render that you shared on Logic. Let me bring that up here. Yeah, and I mean, this is really rough. The, the, these settings weren't tweaked at all, but I mean, this is, this is all procedurally generated CG at 4K HDR in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. 1,300 4K frames rendered in 10 minutes. And it says here, on a Z620 with 64 gigs of RAM and a GTX 1080 Ti. Yeah, I mean, it's really an old machine with not, but, but this is just what the assets do by themselves. I mean, when you're inside the Unreal Engine, you'll notice like, you'll see the foliage kind of drifting. That's just part of what foliage does in the, the game engine. Oh, okay. It has the ability that, to, that's not actually animation. That's just the physics going through what they call the foliage. And then it, it then affects foliage differently. Um, so, so you're able Amazing. to see things float around and blow around automatically. That's wild, man. Let me stop this chair. Yeah, we'll have to get it to anamorphic next time. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, hold on one sec. We have another question here, and that is um, from Brooks. Can you get an NVIDIA GTX and put Windows on the Mac Pro to do the PC aspect or to take, you know, to use it and use it as a PC? Uh, yeah, I think theoretically you can. Now for me, the tricky part is, is that um, personally, I want to be able to have Flame and Game Engine and sometimes Houdini open at the same time. Okay, so if you're using it as boot camp, you can't do it. Okay, your Flame ain't gonna run on Windows. Um, also, from experience, and granted, my hardware is a bit old at this point. And we'll try to upgrade it at some at some point. But you know, you're having all these app, these memory he heavy apps open at the same time. You're going to get crashes. It's going to happen. So having my Houdini and uh, Unreal on the PC while I'm working on the Mac with the Flame is sort of helpful. Um, it it takes the load off of any one machine. Um, so the answer is yes, and I, I know people do boot camp uh, using Windows uh, on, on Mac hardware or, or game stuff. For me personally, it was not the way to go because I want my flame up at the same time. And I would suspect on Linux that the graphics drivers are more up to date on the game engine stuff than they may be on flame. So whether or not that's able to be dual boot, I don't honestly know. Um, again, you still might need two boxes for this kind of, it, it, it with, with Flame having its own needs versus the game engine. Well, Jack chimed in and said that you should get separate boxes and I'm not gonna argue with Jack. I agree, it, it, it's helpful. Get two strong boxes, get a whole mm -hmm. raft of them. <laughs> but of course, none of us are working, so none of us are here. So. Right. And then Jack is chiming in again saying Houdini will kill a machine. Houdini's fantastic. Okay. I, I, I think there's a lot of the, what's very interesting about Houdini and some of the stuff we'll get into in the next video is that it's able to create assets that are populated within the game engine. Um, so that if you wanted to create uh, build, you know, generate buildings from OSM data, it could automatically, depending on what the data says, each, building type is you could have different buildings just automatically form. You can have streets that that generate and at the corners of each street you can, it has a higher probability of having 
traffic lights and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it just suddenly you building the uh, Rube Goldberg machine that then suddenly when it goes into the other thing, it automatically works because what it's doing inside of Unreal is it's using the Houdini code to to work. Um, okay. It's not uh, so the tool is using a, a you know, terminal shell version of Houdini as far as I can understand it to then work within the game engine. Uh, it it's really fascinating. And then they, Houdini also has something called PDG, which is uh, dynamic graphing, procedural dynamic graphing, which would allow you to do things like so. I've seen it work in Unity. I haven't been able to get it working yet in Unreal. But you could be, if you had, say, say you have a bridge asset inside your game, your environment in, in your game, in Unity, I guess, in this case. As you move it around, the t terrain could actually know that that bridge asset needs to have things move around it. So mm -hmm. as you move it around it, PDG will, will separate the terrain into tiles. So suddenly you'll see the tiles start to update inside the game engine while you're in it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of mind blowing to try to wrap your head around. Um, but what it basically does is it, it takes things that are, it, it takes processes and makes them available to everything on your farm. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, I think we talked on, uh, earlier between you and I, when, you know, particle generation mm -hmm. is usually a linear thing. It can only be done on one product. You need the previous frame to understand what the next frame is going to look like. Now, if you wanted to do a wedge of particle sims, PDG would basically stream it out to lots of different places, then assemble it back at the end and show you the assembled wedge using every machine it can find. So it, you, it's really uh, uh, decentralizing kind of workflow. It, uh, it even gets more so, there's a format called USD that's in Unreal and in Houdini that has even more promise, but that's a, that's also a big, big um, wild. All right, well, let's move on to the third video. I had a post that showed how you could use Google Maps 3D data to generate simple geo, which is but a little motion capture guy in Houdini, so that we can give an idea of what real world scale is. And so I have a couple of cameras I've set down here, ground level version. Just going to pause this or interrupt for one second. So now you're, this is uh, taking place in Houdini and you've downloaded uh, Google Maps data, correct? Yeah. So what ended, so in the post that I had, um, basically uh, there was a hack which takes the, the data from Google Maps and debug mode, you can take that data and capture it before it gets to your monitor and then you can bring it into Blender. You have to go through Blender for this, and it has to be on Windows, apparently, at least at this point. Um, I will re-send uh, the link, but basically I just went through and did what it showed how to do, and it is, does in fact work. Now the data looks nice as a model, but here you can see that when we're looking at it as real world scale, um, it's, you know, it's not really holding up. It looked nice from afar, but you know, this isn't gonna sell anybody on previews. <laughs> When they say one pixel equals one meter, they mean one pixel equals one meter, right? Hmm. Okay, let's go back. You can really see how very lumpy. Great for getting a rough idea for something, but at the end of the day, it's not necessarily the best of solutions. There's another option called Mapbox. It's a plugin for Houdini using OSM data. I think it's available in other applications as well. But so if we were to take a look at it up here, we have, there's our little motion capture guy. Now what's interesting is, is that we have building data that is generated by the OSM data. OSM is OpenStreetMaps. So basically it has all sorts of information that comes along with it, different kinds of buildings or building zones, all sorts of crazy stuff. What's handy about this kind of solution is that they have a way of generating clean geometry that's based on something. The heights are part of the OSM data. The ground level, you can see that you know, there's it, it's you know the buildings, although very basic, are much more useful as geometry.
again, there's a little motion capture guy right down there. So just to give you a quick idea of what Mapbox does, generates a height field. It's like a volume that basically has the, the height mapped to it. It's not geometry, it's more of a volume. And you can also do things like you can generate buildings from it. And you can see that there's actually kind of an interesting amount of detail. And if we look at, you know, what's coming in through the data, you know, then you can see like there's, you know, how many levels, street addresses, postcodes, not all this stuff is, is particularly helpful, but there, there's ways of filtering this information so it sets certain kinds of buildings to automatically generate, for instance, in Unreal. We have roads can be generated too, and basically what the red areas are like intersections so that, for instance, you could end up having traffic lights more populated at intersections or different kinds of things happening. It's a procedural workflow that uses this data to generate things in a intelligent way. It's an intro to Mapbox. Continuing on Mapbox, I kind of have a few movie locations that I've pre-set up so that we can take a look at our actor in different environments. This is Monument Valley, big fan of Westerns. Got a medium, got the light in. This, you know, he's very, very small here compared to this. And by the time we get out to the super wide, um, he's really tiny. You have to zoom in to really find him. But really, this is a uh, three by three map box element. It's about, uh, this looks to be about 13 thousand meters across, roughly. Another example we might have our actor in for Django, the mountain pass that is used for this. And it's easy just to type in the lat long of these areas. He's looking at from these different uh, vantage points. is just tiny compared to this environment. Now, an environment like this is too rough for detailed work, but you know you can start adding Quixel-type assets like trees and grasses make this stuff really work. But being able to see the greater topography and scale of an area is really quite helpful. Uh, moving on, we've got our actor to be hanging out on the Braveheart mountain range. So we've got him right on the mountainside. Even so, he is that's a really big mountain. He's just a tiny, tiny little guy. And then by the time we're out for the super wide, yeah, I think he's in this area right over here. This is Ben Nevis. I think this is where Mel Gibson was running up right, was right there. Another option, perhaps we could go visit the fictional area where uh, up was. I think it was this waterfall that's based on Angel Falls in South America. And we have our to scale where he's really standing on the edge of this falls. The color map didn't really come through on this one. Every once in a while you'll run into areas where the color map doesn't come through. Again, a lot of this stuff will be better done if you texture it using pixel assets or something like that. So then you can then scatter foliage and rocks and trees and all stuff and make it look realistic at a close level, but you know, you still get a great idea of how vast this is. So we have Niagara Falls. You know, he's standing here on the edge of the falls. And if we were to go out to the wide, Who's that tiny little guy over here? We've got some, you know, buildings roughed in from the OSM data. 
and go back to the super wide. Kind of see Niagara Falls. I think that this could have a lot of use for the scouting locations. Some of this stuff isn't going to be up to stuff that you can start putting people here at a real scale and then kind of understanding what's going on. You know, I picked a, an area of midtown Manhattan, pal to be standing on top of a building, like such. Um, so again, he's standing on top of the building. This is a, more or less to scale. And then if you went to the super wide, I've only done the buildings for the center tile of the map box. This is an easy way to quickly generate huge worlds. You know, between Houdini and Unreal, there's lots of ways of instancing geometry to be able to take advantage of all this OSM data, use it uh, to just to visualize real world scale. Pixel Bridge is a huge library of assets that they've collected from photogrammetry to the detail of all these things is just phenomenal. There's so many different things to pick through on here. There's textures, there's 3D objects. It's definitely worth your time. So like for the 3D assets, there's so much stuff. So the idea is that you signed in, then basically you can download these, and then once you've downloaded them, then export to your application uh, Unreal, it could also be other things that take FBX, Houdini, Maya, etc. I believe the library is completely free as long as your final renders are through Unreal. Quixel also has given us some demo projects to take a look at. Um, these are pre-made um, animations of camera and assets. Uh, answer is the closest thing that we have to getting things in and out for official effects. So, since this is where you would save your image sequence or movies, this is also where you might import FBXs if you had animated characters that you were using in there. The amount of detail in these uh, assets is jaw dropping. I mean, a full 3D environment, so you know we can get real close to things. It's if we sort of then look at it through camera viewer that's been put into our sequencer, then we can see these pre-composed shots. There's so much there that I mean it just takes a lot to sort through. Quality um, is still quite quite stunning. You know, I'm on old hardware, so I'm not sure. I think is that the lighting needs to be rebuilt. A lot of it comes down to how efficiently you can pre-build the stuff so that that runs well um, and cleanly, so you can record your imagery that you're you're pumping through it, and also things such as uh, building focus. You can be moving lights around, and all that changes can be cut out through either through FBX or captured through the image sequence to really high quality. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, there's a lot out there. It's it's really not that hard to start playing around. It's just you know, uh, and it's it's worth it's worth checking out. Mm -hmm. Totally. I know. I just want to make sure everyone sees. Brooks pointed out here in the chat that uh, he's seen people tie the OSM information in with time of day and sun angle during the year, so they can know where the sun's going to be on a given date to do a shoot. And absolutely. Uh, it, Oh, it's amazing. And then, of course, to be able to map that stuff out to scale is, is, really, where, is where, really where it gets invaluable. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, one of the reasons why I prefer Houdini is basically almost any data can come in through it. And then you can, if it's not acting the way you'd expect it to, you can kind of force it into another way so that the app that you're expecting to get it out of uh, reacts as you'd expect. Like, for instance, there's going to be times with the Quixel uh, mega scans assets like 3D plants. You might have to go through a CG app first and then export it as an FBX because some things there's just not available in uh, in Flame, such as they have ideas of atlases, which is kind of like multiple plants 
on the same texture. So it's accessing a section of what that texture is. Um, okay. We don't have an easy way or level of detail calls and stuff like that. So you might want to have to go through the CG app as your hub to then say, okay, Flame, here's your clean FDX. You know? mm -hmm. um, and, and most of them can do something like that. You just gave me a great idea for a feature request, adaptive degradation based on distance from camera. Yeah, it's level of detail. It just needs to, yeah. if, they, if, 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 if Flame could import FBX with level of detail, it would automatically do that. Wild. Or it could be. Does anybody, it could be. Does anybody have any other questions for Andy? Keeping an eye. Oh, here you go. Also from Brooks. Um, have you done any cloud rendering? I'm assuming through Unreal. Uh, haven't. I mean, the, the thing is, is that uh, cloud rendering, I think, would be more critical. Right now, the rendering on Unreal is so fast that I, I don't think it's really all that necessary. And I haven't yet figured out how to push all that data across um, because it's all based inside the project. So I haven't, I haven't tried it for, uh, for Unreal. In CG type apps, yeah, you, you, you might want to try to do that somehow, figure out a way of being able to do your renders so that you can you know, use as many processes as you could. But I'd say that in, in the game engine, the rendering is so fast anyways that it's really, uh, I feel like you're, you're figure, until I get a need to do such a big world that it's taking me uh, a couple hours or days to get a render out, which would be like traditional CG, I'm happy uh, as it is. Sweet. Any other questions for Andy? All right. Well, thanks, man. Well, I hope thanks it was so helpful. For taking the time to share. Oh, it was great. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's eye-opening to see what else is out there and, uh, and what other options are available for, for visual effects. So thanks as always. Yeah. And thank you for always contributing to Logic Community, man. I really appreciate it. All good. All right. Let's close this out. So coming up in Logic Live next week, we're going to have Naveen Srivastava from, uh, uh, from Toronto doing some, uh, some spot and some shop breakdowns for us. Got a bit of a schedule change for you here. Uh, on August 2nd, we're going to have Renee Tim come on, and uh, she's going to take us through building and running your flame business at home. Um, she's really an amazing, amazing person, and I'm so she reached out to me, and I'm so thrilled uh, that she wants to share this information with everybody, especially with you know, everything going on. So definitely tune in for that. August 9th, we're going to have Chicago's own Randy McEntee. And on, there we go, August 16th, using Flame with Shotgun uh, with uh, the aforementioned Alan Letary and, uh, and Jesse Morrow. Be sure to check out the Logic Podcast. I have a new episode coming out this Wednesday. So if you haven't subscribed in your podcatching app of choice, please do. And of course, this episode and all the other, uh, the past episodes of Logic Live are available on logic.tv. Uh, there's links there to the podcast and all other kinds of great Logic content. Please take the time if you haven't already to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors, AJA and Sinistus Oceana. That's going to do it for this, week, uh, this week's episode, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in and we will see you next week.